Okay, we have to bring everybody in. Bring everybody in from the entryway. Very good. I'm Rusty Reno, and I'm the editor of First Things Magazine. And it's my, thank you, thank you. And it's my pleasure to welcome everyone to the 34th, no, 35th, you've got it on your program, annual Erasmus lecture. And it's my pleasure tonight to introduce Archbishop Anthony Fisher, who will deliver this year's Erasmus lecture. Archbishop F Fisher adds luster to the marvelous list of past Erasmus lecturers, which we have listed in the program. He has served in the office of bishop since 2003, first as auxiliary bishop in Sydney, and then as the ordinary in the diocese of Parramatta in Australia, and finally back to Sydney where he succeeded Cardinal George Pell and was installed as Archbishop in 2014. Now, although he serves in high office, Archbishop Fisher is first and foremost uh, a moral theologian. He got his DPhil from Oxford University. And, you know, as I was preparing this introduction, Oxford as an Oxonian, I thought he would appreciate, maybe we could all appreciate, what my fellow editor Dan Hitchens has nominated as the letter of the year. It was a letter to the Guardian newspaper in England, and it ran as follows. This is a, Peter Young writes that Nunyan Tai Pyong Tao will be the first minority woman to give her name to an Oxford college. And by the way, I looked her up. She is the founder of Viet, uh, Viet Air, I think, it's Vietnamese airline, which as one friend described, it's the hooters of the airline industry. <laughs> She's obviously got a genius for marketing. Um, so it's the first minority woman to have her name on an Oxford college. But two colleges founded in the 14th century were named after a Jewish peasant woman living in Roman-occupied Palestine 2,000 years ago. They are the House of the Blessed Mary the Virgin in Oxford, commonly called Oriel College of the foundation of, king, of Edward II of famous memory, sometime King of England, and St. Mary's College of Winchester, Oxford, known as New College to avoid any confusion with Oriel. Among later foundations, St. Anne's College, named after Mary's mother, and St. Catherine would probably also fit the criteria. So as, a, as an Oxonian, <laughs> he, he is a Mary Oxonian, uh, Archbishop Fisher. He's published numerous books and articles on bioethical questions, including in First Things Magazine, and I should use this as an occasion to say that if there's anyone in this room who is not a subscriber to First Things Magazine. Well, shame on you. <laughs> All of the cool kids are reading First Things. You need to get on board. Archbishop Fisher has served as professor of moral theology at the John Paul II Institute for Marriage and Family since 2000. And no doubt it was Archbishop Fisher's deep theological knowledge that led Pope Francis to appoint him to the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith in 2015. A moral theologian Especially, especially a moral theologian who plays a prominent role in the church's leadership. That sort of person stands at the collision point between ap the apostolic tradition and contemporary secular society. Hostility to the Christian understanding of our moral duties and their role in the good life has only intensified in recent years. I think everyone in this room knows that. Undaunted, Archbishop Fisher has stood as a consistent and courageous voice, and not just courageous, but confident and always willing to give the reasons for the hope we have within us. And I submit that we need these reasons and that hope, for we're living in darkening times. War haunts the borders of Europe. Many countries in the West are in an agony of political change and upheaval Social media echoes with denunciation and the very foundation of our created nature as men and women are being, as being repudiated. Now last night, the poet David Middleton was, ended his reading 
with a portion of W. H. Auden's poem in memory of W. B. Yeats. And the year he composed this was 1939, a time darker certainly than our own. But, and Auden's final exhortation I'll read here is to poets. But to my mind, they're addressed to us all. And these words capture the wealth of Archbishop Fisher's witness. So Auden, <clears throat> follow poet, follow right to the bottom of the night with your unconstraining voice, still persuade us to rejoice. With the farming of a verse, make a vineyard of the course. Sing of human unsuccess in the rapture of distress. And in the deserts of the heart, let the healing fountains start. In the prison of his days, teach the free man how to praise. Please join me in welcoming Archbishop Anthony Fisher, a much needed vineyard maker and teacher of praise. Well, thank you. Uh, it is a very great honour to give the 35th Erasmus Lecture, given how much the previous lecturers and other contributors to First Things have taught me over the years. In fact, I feel rather daunted to be in their company. And what's more, I'm doomed to sound like Crocodile Dundee to you. <laughs> But here goes. <laughs> it became clear to me that my personal Christian faith is not tolerated or permitted in the public square, at least by some and perhaps by many. So said the CEO of one of Australia's largest football clubs after being forced to resign one day into the job. His demise followed revelations that he was the board chair of a group of conservative Anglican churches. And that a decade earlier, one of the pastors had preached some fiery sermons on the sanctity of life and sexual morality. It didn't matter that the executive was not a member of the congregation at the time, had never heard the sermons in question, had himself said nothing to offend progressive orthodoxies, and had previously championed diversity and inclusion initiatives as CEO of a major bank. He was cancelled simply for associating with a group espousing traditional Christian beliefs. The state premier weighed in, demonising the man's church and by implication the man himself as hateful, bigoted, and absolutely appalling. After the Anglican and Catholic archbishops spoke in the man's favour, the Premier, who advocate, advocates abortion, euthanasia, same-sex marriage and other leftist causes, suggested that he was a better Christian and Catholic than them. We could point to many cases of persecution of Christians in recent decades and other examples of what Pope St Paul VI called the great drama of our time, the split, sometimes collision, between the gospel and culture. Of course, there can be a Christian culture and liberal cultures can be more or less hospitable to religion. But Western societies that long traced their genealogy to the twin wisdoms of Jerusalem and Athens seem to be taking a different direction. Which brings me to part one of four, for any of you who are counting how long this is going to take. <laughs> so is 
the West now post-Christian or secular. From the Latin word for temporal or profane, seculum, come our words secular, secularity, secularization, and secularism. By secular, we mean the affairs and powers of this world, in contrast to spiritual or otherworldly ones. Secularity denotes not only a distinction, but some degree of separation of church and state, with each sphere and its agents having a certain freedom from the other. And secularization describes the process of further separating these, converting aspects of reality from spiritual to temporal explanation, use, influence or control, and minimising or privatising religion. Where other civilizations identified sacred and profane power, Christianity insisted that some things be rendered unto Caesar and some to God, even if these overlap and we bring one conscience to both. St Thomas Aquinas, for instance, made clear distinctions between the ends, methods and provinces of philosophy and theology, of imperfect worldly and perfect godly beatitude, of civil law and church authority. In his magnum opus, A Secular Age, Charles Taylor argues that that ancient Christian compact was already unravelling by the Renaissance Reformation period. The closure of religious houses, seizure of church property, rise of anti-clericalism and horror of the wars of religion opened the gates to a humanism that disembeds individuals from society, society from the cosmos, and the cosmos from God. Now there arose a full-blown secularism, which sought to accelerate the process of disenchantment and in its mo most aggressive form, to mute, even abolish religion altogether. Belief and unbelief became rival accounts of reason, nature, community and happiness. And belief in God became difficult for many in the scientific age. In the following centuries, there were many moves away from a Judeo-Christian viewpoint and support for secularization theory. The idea that as societies become more affluent and scientifically advanced, they inevitably become less religious. As Jonathan Sachs observed, the 17th century saw the secularization of knowledge in the form of Newtonian science and Cartesian philosophy. The 18th century saw the secularization of power in the form of the American and French revolutions and separation of church and state. The 19th century saw the secularization of culture as museums, art galleries and concert halls took the place of churches as houses of the human spirit. And the 20th century saw the secularization of morality as one by one the nations of the West slowly abandoned the Judeo-Christian ethic of the sanctity of life and of the marital bond. By the 1930s, theorists were describing the West as post-Christian. And from the 1960s, this took root in the popular imagination. The Second Vatican Council thought the rise of atheism was among the most serious problems of the age and asked believers whether their own ignorance of the faith or lukewarm witness were contributing to popular unbelief. Six decades later, only fragments of our enchanted past remain, with its sense of mystery and revelation, 
providence and hierarchies. In the new epistemic and moral orders, individuals acquire knowledge empirically, a subject only to themselves, collaborate when it suits, and contribute to efficient production and maximal consumption. The free market, liberal democracy, technologies and social media dominate. And our hermeneutics are of suspicion, materialism, relativism and rupture. The clerical sexual abuse crisis seriously damaged the credibility of the churches and so their ability to respond to the challenges of secularisation. Many individuals, institutions and cultures have now abandoned Christian beliefs, norms and behaviours. Over the past decade alone, the proportion of Americans identifying as Christian fell from 75% to 63%, with three in 10 now identifying as nuns. I wish it was religious sisters nuns. <laughs> but it's nuns in the sense of atheists, agnostics, or nothing in particular religiously. Christians in Britain, Germany, and Australia declined from around six to below five in 10 in the same period, while the nuns rose to four in 10. Most people in the Netherlands today have never visited a church and one in 10 of those who still identify as Catholic say they don't believe in God. Those who do believe and count religion as important in their lives are now just over a half of Americans, a quarter of Canadians, a fifth of Australians, and a tenth of Britons, French, and Germans. Well below two-fifths of American Catholics now attend Mass each Sunday. Around one-fifth of French and Germans, an eighth of Canadians and Australians, 7% of Belgians, and 3% of the Dutch. Many pastors bemoan a lack of young adults. Immigration of more pious populations has masked the scale of this decline but there are many signs of atrophy in Western Christianity. Alistair McIntyre famously suggested in After Virtue that modernity is like the late Roman Empire, living on fragments of old ideas and practices that only made sense within a context now largely lost. Christian institutions such as parishes schools, hospitals, aged care and welfare agencies might seem quite healthy, yet they can lose their souls, so to speak, and become Christian zombies, indistinguishable from secular NGOs. Religious symbols, voices and traditions are also less prominent in the public square, such that some have called it Babylon and believers exiles or resident aliens. Spiritual fairy tales about creation and revelation, liberation through the Red Sea and a first century Nazarene, traditional wisdom about sin and salvation and claims of objective truth have been replaced. First, by secular tolerance and a plurality of competing narratives, of TV gurus, psychotherapists, and other wise sages. And then by anti-religious indoctrination through education and media and the cancelling of religious voices. Secular fixations on autonomy, sexuality, victimhood, diversity and inclusion of everyone except believers inform many contemporary laws and practices. 
Western history, arts and culture are deplored or ignored in many places. And civility in engagement and debate have been replaced by ever-evolving but increasingly bullying rules of the influencers and the wokesters. As a young man backpacking around Europe, deciding my vocation, I spent a fortnight in Florence. Two young guys from Seattle, Washington, arrived at my youth hostel with little more than a day for Florence and asked me if there was much to see. <laughs> Though no expert, I offered to take them around the city the next day. Carved on my memory is an incident in the Uffizi Gallery when one of them turned to me and asked, who is the woman with the baby in so many of the pictures? <laughs> I'd assumed that growing up in a Christian culture, even non-believers would know who Mary and Jesus were. This was back in 1984. Four decades later, Seattle's youth probably know even less about their spiritual patrimony. The confrontation with secularism is reflected in the considerable literature on secularization, including many contributions in First Things and other Judeo-Christian responses. But before we imagine ourselves uniquely cursed, we might recall that similar or graver challenges have been faced before. While he doubtless had his own age in mind, Shakespeare could have been writing about post-modernity when in Troilus and Cressida, he put on Ulysses' lips a lament for a world in which the natural and moral order or degree have been swept away. Oh, when degree is shaked, which is the ladder of all high designs, the enterprise is sick. How could communities, degrees in schools and brotherhoods in cities, peaceful commerce from dividable shores, the primogenity and due of birth, prerogative of age, crowns, scepters, laurels, but by degree stand in authentic place? Take but degree away Untune that string, and hark, what discord follows. Each thing meets in mere oppugnancy. Strength should be lord of imbecility, and the rude son should strike his father dead. Force should be right, or rather, Right and wrong, between whose endless jar justice resides, should lose their names, and so should justice too. Then everything includes itself in power. Power into will, will into appetite, and appetite and universal wolf so doubly seconded with will and power, must make perforce an universal prey, and last, eat up himself. On his return flight from Kazakhstan, Pope Francis told a journalist from La Croix, the West is not in general at its most exemplary right now. it has taken several wrong paths. In repulsing refugees, it's become the watery graveyard of humanity, he said. In ceasing to have children, it's experiencing a demographic winter. The West is decaying, he said, and we must recover our values. As if echoing Shakespeare on the murderous sun and the lupine appetite of the culture, the Pope then gave euthanasia as an example. 
It's inhuman, he exclaimed. Let's leave killing to the beasts. For as Shakespeare's Ulysses concluded, Great Agamemnon, this chaos, when degree is suffocate, follows the choking. To summarise, in modernity, there are different versions of secularity, secularisation and secularism. Milder ones reflect the Christian distinction between the city of God and the city of man, show due respect to people of all religions and none, and enable peaceful coexistence and even some degree of collaboration between church and state. A more extreme secularism, however, casts aside all previous settlements between church and state and seeks to achieve a comprehensively post-Christian reality. Governments, courts and businesses increasingly marginalise believers. There are many signs of disenchantment, disillusion and disaffiliation of the hollowing out of church institutions and adoption of a radically secular worldview. Some would ban crosses from public places, schools, or necks. Even if faith is a majority view or religious freedom a fundamental right, some regard religion as so benighted, even dangerous, that it must be constrained and ultimately eradicated. Those who still identify as believers are encouraged to live as practical atheists. That is, as if there were no God. The New York cannabis smell must replace any whiff of incense in the culture and its institutions. Which brings me to part two. Is the trend towards irreligion inevitable, irreversible, and complete? Addressing the First Assembly of the World Council of Churches in 1948, an exasperated Karl Barth said, post-Christian era, nonsense. How, he asked, had we come to adopt the Nazi propaganda that our world is post-Christian? Why do we imagine that we are the first generation to face the challenge of godlessness? Why do we think the victory of these forces is inevitable? Whence the nostalgia for some golden age of Christendom? In Peter Berger's 2008 paper in First Things, Secularism Falsified, and Rodney Stark's Secularism RIP, the two authors argued that secularisation theory is fundamentally flawed. And I agree for several reasons. First, because history, anthropology and divine revelation testify that human beings are religious animals. Roger Scruton in The Face of God and Christian Smith in Religion, What It Is, observe that people believe in religion because they are persuaded it is true and God-given. Because the spiritual is basic to how human perception, cognition and explanation ordinarily work. And also because religion provides them with community, identity, meaning, ecstasy, beauty, order, and emotional energy. Charles Taylor likewise argues that even in very secularised societies, people crave a fullness, a richness, where life is deeper, worthier, more admirable, a communion of whole lives, of whole itineraries toward God. Of course, there are non-believers whose lives are functional and happy enough. But as religious forms endure, evolve or decay, and as efforts to wipe out religion succeed in some places or fail, 
it seems that religion is somehow irrepressibly natural to human being. Secondly, religion still boasts many adherents. 2.6 billion people worldwide currently profess to be Christian. In the next Christendom, Philip Jenkins details the remarkable expansion of Christianity in the global south during our lifetime. But even in the West, 13 countries still boast more than 90% Christian adherents. Another 22, more than 80%. And a further 24 Western nations are more than two-thirds Christian. Many of the remainder in each are believers. Even in those countries with falling affiliation and practice rates, the story is by no means comprehensive, let alone irreversible. In his magnum opus, Dominion, Tom Holland argues that Christianity is the most enduring and influential legacy of the ancient world. Its emergence, the single most transformative development in Western history, and its faith and values still the most influential of any upon the Western mind. It's still a force to be reckoned with. Third, Secularising societies are, if anything, bucking against the world trend. While about one in six of the world's people now has no religious affiliation, it's projected that by 2060 that will have shrunk to one in eight. Without being smug about it, atheism is in much graver danger of extinction than theism. Fourthly, many Westerners still pray and worship, read the word of God, receive sacraments, live Christian lives, and pass on the faith as best they can. There are pockets of more intense enthusiasm for faith and morals, even amongst young adults. Traditional vocations, for example, to the Dominicans in this country, and new ecclesial movements, thrive in some places. Likewise, evangelization ministries such as the Thomistic Institute, Focus, the Love and Fidelity Network. There are some unembarrassedly Catholic or Christian colleges, forums, magazines. As well as these, more serious believers, some blow hot and cold on their religion, and others say they are spiritual and still searching. Many are still significantly shaped by Christian beliefs and norms, and some report experiences of the numinous. Others entrust themselves or those they care about to faith schools, colleges, hospitals, aged care, welfare and pastoral care services. There are still some political, economic, or cultural leaders of genuine Christian inspiration. There are still prayers in many parliaments, oaths in courts, nations entrusted in their constitution or on their currency to God. Recently, an extraordinary proportion of the world's population witnessed the unembarrassedly religious funeral for a Christian monarch. For many, it was about more than entertaining pageant. Raw figures on declining affiliation don't tell the whole story. Fifth, down the ages, the Christian religion has proven remarkably resilient. Religious affiliation and fervour have waxed and waned, but whenever the death of God has been proclaimed and the end of Christianity predicted, Revival has been just around the corner. And I'll come back to this. In the 19th century, this meant an eruption of new religious orders evangelising the global south and building social infrastructure from which we still benefit today. So too today, there are places where Christian symbolism, voices and traditions are, if anything, more prominent than they were before 
where truth is still honoured, including the Catholic intellectual tradition, where civility in debate and other classic Christian virtues are still practised. There are some counter trends to those noticed in the first part of my paper, such as the dramatic reversal of Roe v. Wade in the recent case of Dobbs and Jackson. Christianity and ideas simpatico to it make a comeback from time to time. Sixthly, post-Christian societies are arguably a particular kind of Christian society. They are rooted in the history, culture and practices of Judeo-Christianity and draw upon its principles even to critique that patrimony. As John O'Sullivan argues, even the Enlightenment, which strong secularists like to cite as the foundation of Western liberal policies, polities, is an extension of Christianity as much as a rejection of it. In short, though much of what Christianity taught is forgotten, even unknown by modern Europeans and Americans, they nonetheless act on its teachings every day. Thus the philosopher Richard Rorty, a mostly atheist, who long predicted the end of religion, came to hold that he could find nothing more useful for underpinning liberal democracy than the New Testament, nothing more effective for instilling respect, empathy and hope than Christian virtue, nothing as inclined to promote trade unionism and other social justice initiatives as the social gospel. Seventh and lastly, for now, secularism lives parasitically or symbiotically with Christian culture because no other host has proven so suitable. In the secular conscience, Austin Dacey, a self-confessed secularist, makes a stronger claim than Rorty. He laments the marginalisation of religion in social discourse because it's not only useful to democracies, but their sine qua non, both underpinning liberal tradition and being its foil. Secularists engage in various vicarious religions with their own priesthoods, symbols and rituals, dogmas and heresies. Unbelievers, like himself, he argues, benefit from encountering beliefs different from their own and are inspired by the Christian determination to secure a rationally informed and compassionate individual conscience and social order. Thin liberal conceptions of the good, on the other hand, offer very little basis for choice or for common life. In the end, we go looking for more. Older members of our audience may recall a scene from Monty Python's Life of Brian, in which John Cleese plays Reg, a member of the People's Liberation Front of Judea. In a terrorist cell meeting, he asked rhetorically, what have the Romans ever done for us? To his frustration, his fellows respond with example after example of the benefits of Roman civilization. All right, all right, Reg concedes, but apart from sanitation, medicine, education, wine, public order, irrigation, roads, a freshwater system and public health, what have the Romans ever done for us? <laughs> for all the historical denial, revolutionary fantasies and plain ingratitude of modernity, the debt of Western civilization to Christianity is much greater. All right, all right, but apart from the sanity that sanctity brings to a world of sin, or the establishment of hospitals, hospices and leprosaria, or the creation of the university and provision of the most comprehensive primary, secondary and tertiary school system in the world, or the endowment and staffing of orphanages, aged care, feeding the indigent and other welfare, 
or the many supports for marriage, family and neighbourhood. Apart from those things, secular culture asks, what have the Romans, Roman Catholics, ever done for us? Apart from ending human sacrifice, cannibalism, slavery, infanticide and the chattel conception of women and children. The explication of a sublime moral code and vision of the virtuous person that still inspire many. Shaping our language and discourse and promoting literacy, printing and libraries. The advent of the scientific method and sponsoring of much subsequent science, medicine and technology. The heritage of art, music, literature and architecture. So much of Western common civil and constitutional law and the corpus of theological and philosophical thought that has provided metaphysical grounding for our politics and so much else. Apart from all that, our secular antagonist presses, what have the Romish ever done for us? If so much of Christian inspiration still survives, there is a base upon which a Christian revival might yet be built. In Post-Christian, a guide to contemporary thought and culture, Jean Veith proposes that Christians should be undaunted at the post-Christian onslaughts, knowing that such onslaughts are ultimately doomed in this world as well as in the next. Christians should just hold on as the post-Christian project eats itself up and get ready for a cultural rebirth, he suggests. The Me Too movement, for instance, for all its complex motivations and contradictory messages, is a corrective to the sexual permissiveness of the previous decades. So the trend is not all in one direction. In some places, young adults are more regular in their practice and more devout than their parents. Contemporary Western secularity may prove to be just another example of the temporary backsliding that has recurred many times in Christianity's long history. Which brings me to part three, pre-Christian, question mark. I don't know if I named the previous ones, but they were post-Christian, question mark, Christian, question mark, now we're pre-Christian, question mark. Wars, civil, international or proxy, insecurity and poverty fueling mass migration, security forces and public services at breaking point, a precarious world economy staring into a financial abyss, political instability, including factionalism, a leadership carousel and low confidence in the state, declining trust in institutions, marriage and family in crisis with high rates of divorce, abortion, infanticide and suicide, old certainties passing, change accelerating, individuals and institutions struggling, subtle and more open persecution of Christians, and as the old religion fades, a pagan hedonism fills the void. Are we talking about 222 AD or 2022? In works comparing the ancient world and the modern, Mike Aquilina and Jim Papandrea have written, the context of the church in the world is moving increasingly toward what, is, what it was before the time of Constantine. This is true especially with regard to the place of religion in society, the values of the dominant culture and popular conceptions of what is acceptable behaviour. The truth is that many self-proclaimed Christians are joining the paganisation of the culture, not to mention the criticism of Christianity itself. Of course, there are different kinds of neo-pagans. Stephen Smith in Pagans and Christians in the City 
argues that many people have concocted a spirituality of gods within nature or themselves, of moral relativism, and of Eastern, Celtic, or New Age spiritual practices that promise health or peace of mind. Some seek to reinvent a pre-Abrahamic religion, perhaps with a dash of witchcraft or diabolism thrown in. There are those, like my young American in Florence, curious but almost entirely innocent of religion. But even these may have gods rather like those of the late Roman world. Private gods, prosperity gods, power gods, pleasure gods, and passing away gods. So polytheistic was the late Roman Empire, having gobbled up the gods of many, the many cultures it had invaded, that every family and individual could choose their own gods to pray and make sacrifice to. When Alexis de Tocqueville coined the term individualism, it was both in admiration and critique of Americans, whom he thought led the West in this quality. Admiration, because putting self first and choosing one's own path was at the heart of the democratic experiment, free enterprise, resilience and achievements of Americans. Critique, because it threatened their ability to hold together, to maintain the common commitments and self-sacrifice underpinning that experiment and those achievements. Individualism has continued to evolve in the West and especially in America. The title of Robert Putnam's Bowling Alone tells it all. Political parties and causes, sport and service clubs, churches and neighbourhoods all struggle for members. But this doesn't mean people have no ideals or are unwilling to associate with others in good projects. It just, it's just that their attention is fleeting. Most of their projects deeply personal and commitment to a common good is waning. In addition to the private deities, the Romans boasted public gods to ensure prosperity and comfort. Abundantia, Ceres, Copia, Fecunditas, Felicitas, Fortuna, Janus, Juno Monitor, Mercury, Ops, Plutus, Saturn and more. While earlier Romans admired a certain asceticism, and were willing to sacrifice a great deal for family, honour, republic or religion, by late antiquity they were much more focused on personal wealth and culture, uh, comfort. Without indulging in caricatures of the Romans as smally Epicureans, the fortunes spent on luxuries for the upper classes and public entertainments for the masses would make even today's Fortune 500 CEOs blush. When Gordon Gekko declared in the 1987 movie Wall Street that greed is good, he spoke for an age in which people would walk over others to achieve their fleeting pleasures and the means to them. In The Enchantments of Mammon, Eugene McCarricker recently argued that capitalism rather than displacing religion in favour of the secular, has deified the market and invented its own priesthood and sacramentals. As well as personal and prosperity gods, the pre-Christian world knew deities that exercised power arbitrarily and from whom devotees hoped to empower themselves. The Romans turned to Hercules, Mars, Mithras, Quirinius and Virtus for military might, or to Jupiter, Roma or Securitas for political influence. All religion was in a sense civic religion and people obeyed authorities as sacral figures. There were few effective restraints on power and the Pax Romana was enforced by brute force. Democratic modernity might seem very different with its egalitarian franchise, participatory politics, reverence for persons, rule of law, and compromise for the common good. 
Yet today we see disengagement, division and deep cynicism about politics in the West. As in late Roman times, a great tradition of rhetoric and debate has degenerated into slogans, ideologies and power games. Opinion polls and influencers now matter more than principles and winner takes all in most contexts. The Romans also had many gods to indulge their baser lusts, such as Bacchus, Cupid, Liber, Priapus, Ven Venus and Voluptus. Though not without shame or censure, they were famously licentious, especially in the courts imperial and heavenly. Prostitution, sexual exploitation of slaves, pornography were widespread. Various substances and spells were used to improve erotic life, and pederasty was not uncommon. St Peter was exaggerating very little when he described Roman life as debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, idolatry, and reckless wild living. Uh, it's describing Rome, not New York. <laughs> it would not be hard to draw parallels with modernity. No one would pretend our age is successful at moderating desire. Sexual activity begins younger and many young people have multiple sexual partners, even in their youth, let alone across a lifetime. The pornographization of the internet means 84% of underage males and 57% of underage females have viewed pornography and many are addicted by age 18. Nor is our time famous for its asceticism. There are no vomitoria, but TV food porn is big. People are bigger, and alcohol and other substances wreak their havoc. In How the West Really Lost God, Mary Eberstad made a powerful case that the sexual revolution and consequent crisis for marriage and family motored the decline in Christianity and repaganization of society as much as vice versa. In the pre-Christian world, deities exercised arbitrary power over life and death. But sometimes you could deal with them. A few might help with health and lifespan, such as Asclepius, Cana, Febus, and Salus. But far more gods brought death, such as Averna, Diatacita, Disparta, the Inferi, Libertina, Mantus, Mors and Morta, Orcus, Pluto, Prosperina, Seranus, and Viduus. Whether in the Pantheon or on Earth, it was a violent world. Assassinations and executions were common, slaves and gladiators killed for public entertainment. Women and children were still considered chattels, and in the third century AD, it was a father's right one frequently exercised to have his baby killed before or after birth. Ours, too, is a violent world. We think of the wicked Russo-Ukraine conflict, the shootings that fill the nightly news, the millions killed by so-called health professionals before or soon after birth or when they are sick and elderly, the violence and abuse at home raging the roads or trolling the net. The ancient cult of violence and death is rhymed in modernity. And so it is we know our private gods, prosperity gods, power gods, pleasure gods, and passing away gods in pre-Christian 2022 as in pre-Christian 222. Rodney Stark thinks secularization theory is premised upon a golden age of faith, whether that's the apostolic age, the Middle Ages, or the 1950s, from which time everything has supposedly been downhill ever since for religion. 
He argues that participation rates were, if anything, lower in medieval times than today, and that periods of high engagement have been the exception. My point here is not to glory in weak associations, but rather to recognise that for much of history, apparently Christian individuals, families and societies have been only partially converted and still partially pre-Christian. I think of my relatives in the Basque country in Spain with garlics hanging all around to ward off evil spirits and the men there delivering their wives to church each Sunday and waiting for them in a bar, supposedly because God listens to women more than men. <laughs> in many places, Christianity seems to run only skin deep after 2,000 years. Which brings me at last to part four. Confused, question mark. Many people think there is a linear progress for, for societies from pre-Christian to Christian to post-Christian. Tonight I've suggested that there are strong reasons to think the modern West is each of these. So which is it? Well, let me make ten concluding points. We hope they're short. <laughs> First, none of these three descriptions, pre-Christian, Christian and post-Christian, can be unqualifiedly applied to the West. All three are influential, even if one dominates in particular times and places. However, uncomfortably, all three religiosities coexist in modernity and compete for the soul of the West. None is yet all out victor. Wheat and tares will continue to grow side by side in the Western field until the divine harvester decides otherwise. Secondly, a great strength of Western civilization has been its facility for engaging alien ideas and customs both contesting and assimilating them, changing them in the process and being changed by them, while maintaining organic integrity due to its Christian soul. Christendom could draw from Jerusalem, Athens and Rome, from the Visigoths, Vikings and Moors, from the recovery of Aristotle and discovery of the new worlds, from civilizations older than its own and sciences newer, from the best minds and most local customs. Christianity can coexist profitably with other discourses. What's more, the three faiths relate in complex ways. Christianity has lived successfully alongside paganism and atheism at different times. Each can teach the other things and each can be a necessary curb to the toxic temptations of the others. Sometimes there will be useful alliances. Post-Christianity both relies upon and protests against Christian premises, but Christian tradition has always allowed a space for the autonomy of the secular. Christians may find postmodern simpatico on human rights and democracy, personal responsibility, initiative and fulfilment, science and technology. But it is with pagans they might find more seriousness about bodiliness, sensuality, sentiment and spirituality. As Thomas Guarino observed, just as Cyril used Plato, so Ambrose used Seneca and Aquinas used Aristotle and Matteo Ricci used Confucius. In other situations, rather than building upon each other or finding commonalities, the three worldviews may complement each other by approaching things differently. As Jonathan Sachs wrote in The Great Partnership, science takes things apart to see how they work, religion puts things together to see what they mean. But fourthly, these three worldviews can point in very different directions. 
Westerners often seem to have a multiple spiritual personality disorder. <laughs> with three different me's speaking for them at once or in turn. That plays out in confusion and dysfunction at times, as I've witnessed in various church assemblies and agencies, let alone in the broader community. Some years ago, Christian Smith and team identified moralistic therapeutic deism as the fastest growing religion amongst American teenagers. Its key doctrines being that there is a God who orders the world and wants people to be nice. Being nice makes you feel good about yourself and makes the world a happier place. You don't have to involve God too much in things, but he's there if you've got problems. And whatever you do, like most people, you'll get to heaven. <laughs> well, this particular chimera of Christian, pre-Christian and post-Christian DNA has infected many. Fifth, all this has implications for evangelization. In calling the church to a new evangelization, the post-conciliar popes highlighted three discrete target groups. The gentes, or unconverted, as in every age. The converted, whose faith must be reinforced against the challenges of modernity. And the diverted, who by baptism, family, institution or culture should be Christian, but are rather disconnected. They suggested the mission to each warrants dedicated energies methods, even workforces. And undoubtedly, that's true. But we must also have in mind that the bulk of Westerners are not one or other of those three things, but are at once part converted, part unconverted, and part diverted. They will need evangelical approaches that address all three dimensions of their spiritual identities and experience at once, as well as the sheer incoherence. We can no longer presume, as in former times, a basic level of religious literacy or even a transcendent perspective. People today may no longer know who the woman and baby are in the paintings. And if the gender theorists get their way, they won't even know it's a woman or a boy. <laughs> Sixthly, if the subjects of the new evangelization have a triple spiritual personality, so do its agents. We are all children of our age, all infected one way or another by the three faiths. One dimension may weigh more heavily with us at particular times or situations. But all three worldviews compete as much for our souls as for the souls of those we seek to evangelise. None of us is 100% pure. To be evangelisers in such a world will require that we are immersed in our culture and appropriately appreciative of it, but also critical of our culture and to some extent quarantined from it. We need both purification and formation to speak to such an age. Seventh, this means both evangelizers and evangelees will need help recovering from excessive secular or pagan influence, rather like those saved from cults. In Tailoring Christianity, Matthew Rose has argued that Charles Taylor is for liberal Christians what Alistair McIntyre is for conservatives. Tailored Christians largely acquiesce in contemporary secularity only believe Christianity with reservations, and focus on imminent goals. McIntyresome Christians maintain a chastened confidence in the power of reason to achieve truth, attend to metaphysics and doctrinal tradition, and found communities of virtue capable of withstanding secular erosion. It's only the latter group that are likely to engage in genuine evangelization. Eighthly, 
Even if McIntyre argues rightly that we can only last so long on the shards of Christian principles and practices, still some of those fragments have proven quite resilient and may be enough for, of a base for recovering a mo more coherent Christian culture in future. But things may have to slip even further before the West will own that, like the prodigal son, it's now living in a moral pigsty and starving spiritually, and before it returns to the Father confessing its sins. Rather than standing aloof like the older brother, traditional Judeo-Christianity will be there to help, even if, as Joseph Ratzinger predicted, it's smaller but more spiritual, with its faithful no longer merely carried by the tribe, but having decided for faith for themselves. Ninth, we're nearly there. <laughs> the aggression of some ex-Christians neo-pagans and faux Christians toward real Christianity pays tribute to its continuing spiritual power. During the Diocletian persecution of 303 AD, all legal rights of Christians were rescinded. Their churches raised, their worship banned, their clerics imprisoned, their members purged from the establishment, and many enslaved and executed. Christianity was doomed. Yet nearby, the eremitical, monastic and patristic movements were flowering. And only 10 years later, a new emperor with a sainted mom decreed the Constantinian peace of the church. At the end of the first millennium, Amidst corruption of church leadership and the re-emergence of dualism, a dark dualism in Europe, who would have imagined the medieval flowering ahead? Promoted by a revived papacy, scholastic friars with universities and great preacher saints. In the depths of the Reformation, when Christendom splintered and was nearly overrun by the Moors, few would have predicted the spiritual renaissance progressed by humanistic Jesuits and others, or the extraordinary mission to the new world, or again the oodles of saints. During the vandalism of the 19th century, revolutionary in Napoleonic France, and the rise of totalizing ideologies that ultimately killed millions in 20th century Europe, Russia, China, and beyond, who could credit the rise of new religious orders and lay ecclesial movements, new missionary energies and the new evangelization that was witnessed? Since the first Pentecost, the church's ordinary rhythm has been growth and decay, purification and renewal. So in our time, flanked by the pagan gods of self, wealth, politics, sensuality and death, and by a secularism aimed at neutering Christianity, we may still pray for a springtime for the church. There are plenty of signs with dissatisfaction with what we have. With the atomism and thin value set of late liberalism that undermine identity, character, attachments and civic orientation. With the broken relationships and growing isolation loneliness, narcissism, anxieties and addictions, with the deification or demonization of the market and liberal democracy, with the values disorientation, social divisions, gender ideology, manufactured outrage, plain meaninglessness, and with the poverty of the sacred. Worshipping private gods or oneself does not bring the fulfilment, communion, and transcendence people crave. But tenth, and finally, for Christianity to do great things for humanity again, it must recover its voice. We must speak the truth in love, boldly and in words and deeds. 
We must eschew privatisation and bracketing that would make Christianity irrelevant. We must see the current chastisement of the church as an opportunity for purification and a promise of resurrection. To survive times like these will require a robust de-secularisation and de-paganisation of some institutions and hearts. A clear-sighted, intelligent and fervent faith. More effective telling of the Christian story through preaching, teaching, arts, education and media. Renewed confidence in the Christian anthropological, soteriological and ethical vision. Cultivation of a deeply affective, liturgical, devotional life. The witness of lives of justice, compassion and holiness. The renewal of supportive communities of family, parish, school, association and society. A willingness to dialogue and collaborate with people who are more post or pre-Christian than Christian. Patience fidelity and hope to persevere through dark times. Above all, the grace of the Holy Spirit to whom we pray, come. As St Peter told the persecuted church, dear friends, I urge you, live such good lives among the pagans that though they suspect you of wrongdoing, they may see your good deeds and glorify God for them. Political conflicts, culture wars, discrimination and institutional diminishment are not what we'd wish for. But nor should we flee them, for they are opportunities to witness to the gospel. Only this kind of Christianity can honestly say it loves God and humanity and will go wherever God and humanity are without fear of being sullied or bruised. Only such a Christianity can reunite a divided church and culture, provide a foundation for a genuinely tolerant pluralist society, and bring God and humanity closer together. When we do these things, we are not post-Christian or pre-Christian or insipidly pseudo-Christian. Amidst all the complexity, we're simply being authentically Christian. The Archbishop has agreed to, uh, to field some questions, and so I will be, I will call on folks if we have questions. Um, maybe I could exercise the prerogative of asking the first question then. Re resilient shards, you said. Our tradition has striking resilience. I think it was 1988 that Joseph Ratzinger gave uh, Erasmus lecture about biblical interpretation. And it strikes me in the intervening decades, the recession of what an overly dominant historical critical um, tradition from in the academy and in the church has really made the Bible more widely available to us than in the past. Do you see the Bible returning in the life of Catholics? Uh, thank you. I, I entirely agree. I think it was obviously one of the great aspirations of the council whose 60th birthday we're celebrating, uh, that, that, that Catholics should learn from their Jewish and Protestant brothers and sisters and really know their scriptures well. And, uh, and, and many did. Let's, let's not oversimplify things. Many did, but many didn't. And I, I think it is the case that, that we've got past the, 
the kind of biblical exegesis that just so deconstructs the text that there's, there's no word of God left in it. Uh, there's no word that speaks to the soul and nourishes the soul left. Uh, we've got past that largely, which is not to say we have nothing to learn from scientific exegesis. We have lots to learn from it. But we, we want to get to the heart of what God is speaking to each reader. And I, I think we are probably in a better place to do that than we were when we're in the grip of, of a purely historical critical method of reading the scriptures or in a previous generation where you just left it for father to tell you what the scriptures said because he knew best and you didn't need that book. My grandmother, when she, she was a Presbyterian who became a Catholic to marry my grandfather, and her parish priest told her, well, you should give your Bible away now. <laughs> uh, because it's my job to tell you what it says. <laughs> well, I, it was a terrible thing, and Grandma hid her Bible, kept it for herself, as she should have. Uh, and uh, thank heavens, I don't think there'd be any, anyone saying that sort of thing today. Questions from the floor. Yes. We get, to, we get the microphone for you. Thank you so much, Archbishop, for your words. I have a question about the role of Islam nowadays. Um, I live with some French people, and they've been telling me how in France the most popular name is Mohammed at the moment, and that they failed to do surveys on religion in France because um, actually Islam is probably the most predominant rich religion uh, in France at the moment. And so in, in contrast to um, the movement of Christianity nowadays, what would your words be on the movement of Islam? I did, at, at several points in my talk, talk about Judeo-Christianity, because I think the, the commonalities with Judaism are, are many and striking and obvious, and the, uh, the issues for us both are very similar. Uh, and, and the alliances that we can make uh, are, uh, are many. I, I think that some of that might be true with Islam too, but only some of that. Um, I think it, it is the case that, for instance, we share a transcendent perspective. We believe in a God, in fact, one God. Uh, and we believe in a world beyond this world and, and that, that our lives in this world affect our destiny in the next. And We have a lot of commonalities in terms of, the, of Abraham and, the, and the, the, the biblical stories and so on. So it's not like there's no common ground there. Uh, but they're not as natural an ally in dealing with the, the problems I've, I was discussing today. Uh, uh, and partly I think it's because apart from a brief flowering in, in uh, particularly in Spain and some other places, uh, Islam didn't live alongside Christianity and Judaism and develop a culture that knew how to talk to those things. It just engaged in conquest of those things where, in most places where it could. Uh, so I don't think it's learnt, as we've learnt, as, as Jews and Christians have learnt, how do you get along with pagans and with pre, pre and post Christians? How do you find things in common and, as, and even sometimes celebrate your differences? How do you make alliances? How do you speak respectfully to each other and even seek to convert each other uh, without taking to each other with swords? Uh, there hasn't been as much of that in the history of Islam as, as it's evolved, which is not to say there are not some Muslim people who would be every bit as polite and civil and respectful as any of us. Um, but, I, but I think it is a more complex thing to work out how some of the questions I've discussed tonight uh, would be dealt with by, by Muslims and with Muslims. Yes. Yes, the, the young lady there, yes. Thank you. Um, I was wondering about the idea of this neoliberalist um, 
religion, actually, becoming stronger than paganism, um, people believing more blindly in it um, than paganism, so it would be harder to actually surpass. Is, can you speak to that a little bit and hopefully tell me that I'm wrong? <laughs> uh, what, what the neoliberalist religion, what, could you just say what, what you mean by that? Uh, just identity politics and okay. all of the things that are kind of controlling all the tech companies and everything these days. Okay. Well, you, I think most of that is actually either post-Christian or pre-Christian. So it's actually a secularist move to, to marginalise and exclude all religion and, and interpret all reality in secular categories or a, or a reversion to a kind of hedonism and uh, pagan conception of, of life in terms of, of power and uh, uh, pleasure. And, and the like, as, as I've outlined tonight. So I think that's what is going on in that world. It's, now, there's probably bits of Christianity in there too, still surviving, the shards uh, that survive and they don't even notice them, but actually they still, they still take for granted that normally, normally you tell the truth to your friends at least, uh, normally you keep your promises and your contracts. Uh, and so that they've got bits of it still, uh, it's not like these people are totally corrupted by, by that, those new beliefs. There's still things, I think, that we can build on, that we have in common, but there's a lot of converting to be done there too. Um, you know, the, the greed is good stuff uh, from Gordon Gekko uh, was, of course, fueling Silicon Valley and you know, a lot that was happening at that time. It wasn't just the thing in, on Wall Street. It was on the other side of the country too, and across the Western world. Uh, and uh, it's pagan, and it has to be converted. Uh, but we do that with love and respect and persuasion and readiness to learn from them as well as try and, and persuade. All right, let's have a final question in the back. The gentleman in the back, yes. We got um, your microphone. Very thank good. you. Um, Bishop Robert Barron likes to talk about um, young Samuel, who was called by God when he, when he was under Eli's care, and how Samuel grew up to be a great prophet at a time when Israel desperately needed a great prophet. And he likes to conclude that remark by saying, where are the Samuels? Go and find them, because we need to find them and support them and grow them. So I pose that question to the assembly and to you, where do we look for them? Uh, thank you. I think that's a very important question for us to be asking. Um, I, um, I try to put a lot of my energy into young people, and I've done that for a long time. You might know I organised a little gathering called World Youth Day in Sydney <laughs> some years ago. That's the hardest thing I'll ever do, and I'll never do that to myself again. But, <laughs> but it was wonderful for our country, because it did bring forth lots of Samuels. And still today, we're, I'm talking 2008, so we're, we're uh, 14 years on, we're still getting vocations, uh, we're still getting wonderful marriages, we're still getting people who at that time first started thinking about where God fits into their life and, and where they're gonna fit into the bigger story of God's life. So uh, yes, we've got to be thinking of the, the strategies to get to the next generation of our prophets and, and pastors and uh, great lay leaders, parents and, and, and professionals and politicians and all the rest. We need great Christian believing examples of all those things. Uh, I, I think that it's, there are many sides to what we have to do to motivate them to focus them, uh, because often I find a lot of the of our uh, Catholic youth, and it's mostly Catholic youth I, I meet, uh, are full of goodwill as much as any generation before them, but I think their attention is often fleeting. They're, they're jumping from thing to thing to thing. There's so many things going on. I, I, I think the the young person who has to be on a device at the same time as watching TV or a movie and talking to somebody, 
They can't be focused on any one of those things at once. Uh, tells you about what's happening to their brains and their culture and their behaviour growing up and how we keep them, get them focused on what most matters to give themselves heart and soul to some really good thing uh, and not just flit from one good thing to another or one indifferent or not so good thing to another. Uh, I think it means that uh, Pope John Paul the Great's uh, brilliant invention of World Youth Day, what is he, he, he grasped that a lot of young people were not ready to commit to doing a course over the next 27 weeks, um, but you get them to some big thing that attracts their attention, then you can start to work with them afterwards. Um, and uh, I think that there's a, often, you, you start with things that will hook a young person um, and then you've got to try and, and fill that out afterwards. So don't let them get away afterwards, um, but, but keep working through with them afterwards. And I, uh, I mentioned the Thomistic Institute. I think it's been a very clever thing invented um, in uh, this part of the country for bringing the classical Catholic intellectual tradition to young people. Um, and they don't even realise that they're signing up for something that's not just 27 weeks, but possibly 270 weeks or 2,700 weeks, because it will never end. Uh, but you, you get them in and you, you give them bite-sized bits that, and attractive ways of thinking and talking. And uh, I, We mustn't lose hope for those, new, those Samuels uh, and... Uh, it took him a while to work out what God was asking and uh, he uh, came back several times in the night till he finally worked out what was going on as a, as a boy. Uh, and, uh, you know, our, our young ones might take a while to, to hear what God's saying and, and find their place, but, but uh, God will not stop calling the prophets that we need and the pastors and parents and all the others uh, until the great harvest at the end. Please join me in thanking Archbishop Fisher again. Thank you for coming. I, I can announce that the 2023 Erasmus Lecture will be delivered by Carl Truman, um, um, I think a favorite author for many folks in First Things Magazine. So as they say at Passover next year in Jerusalem, but let's make it next year in this room in New York City. So please come to the 2023 Erasmus Lecture and thank you so much for coming this evening.